Morning, everybody. Welcome. All right, I want to tell you today about Pivotal and our mission to transform how the world builds software. Now, there, there's something really cool about software, right? It's, it's very different from, say, building bridges. Uh, when you build a bridge, you have to spend a lot of time thinking about it and a lot of time building it before it's ready to share with the world. What does that mean? Well, you can make a plot to understand what that means. You know, as a function of time, you can look at cost. So when you're thinking about it, you're spending some money paying the people who think about it, but you're not spending too much. But then you start building it, and the costs skyrocket. And then you have to maintain it. Makes sense. But what about value? When does a bridge become valuable? Not here. It's only valuable when it's actually done and ready for the world to use. That's scary. That delta right there, that's risk. And because the risk is so high, because these projects are so expensive, we invest a lot in risk mitigation. Now, good risk mitigation looks like getting feedback on your design early. And if you do this well, you end up in a place where you've delivered something that the world likes. Let me give you an example from Dubai, where I grew up. So Dubai's built a lot of crazy things, things that the world loves. World's tallest building, world loves it. Massive shopping malls, indoor ski slopes, visible from the food court, world loves it. But it doesn't always work out this way. Sometimes, despite all your effort, you build something that's actually low value. Here we go again, back to Dubai. Massive artificial archipelago of islands in the shape of the Earth. $2 billion to construct. Whoa. Eight years later, completely barren, massive archipelago of islands. Turns out nobody wants to live on one of these very expensive things. That's not great. That's a failure of risk mitigation and a terrible outcome. Now, thankfully, software is not like bridge building. Software has two glorious properties. First, there's low cost to change. And second, is low cost to distribute. When you put these two things together, you can live in a world where you enjoy rapid iteration. So instead of this, things look more like this. And because they look more like this, because it's easy to distribute software, we can share it with the world, get feedback, have that feedback drive innovation, which because of the low cost to change, we can then iterate on and build very rapidly, and then rinse and repeat. Now, because you can do this, the graph looks very different. Here you have a software team that's working, so your cost is just growing linearly with time. But you're able to deliver value incrementally. So what happens to risk? Well, risk is a lot lower. But more importantly, you have frequent opportunities to course correct. This is rapid iteration. And rapid iteration is how you win in the software economy. But. This is actually true, because <laughs> if it's not, then this doesn't work. So let's dig into it. What about low cost to change? Is that true? Well, here's what development looks like, right? You've got a group of people working on some code. And as they work, things are going well. The code gets bigger. And then you know, the organization goes, hey, that's working really well. Let's throw some more developers at it. And so these folks come, and they want to reinvent the wheel. And so they go at it, and you know, they're happy. The code's gotten bigger, but these folks are upset. Now, there isn't a lot of time, though, because more folks show up, and now they start to add their stuff. They fly into action. Now, the code gets bigger, and it keeps happening. More people show up. And before you know it, it's just a total mess, and everybody's angry. And then they break into factions, and they start pulling and tugging on this thing, and it's just, it's just stuck. It's stuck in this world mired with complexity, wheels being reinvented, competing directions, miscommunication, conflict. I'm exaggerating, obviously, but this is, in a nutshell, the problem with the monolith. And when you live in that world, you don't have this, you have this. So it's not actually low cost to change. Well, what about low cost to distribute? Well, again, there, let's think about the developer, right? The developer loves their software. And because they love it, they want to give it to the world. So to give it to the world, they have to grab a computer, take their software in a roll of duct tape, attach it to the computer, grab an operating system, attach that to the computer, grab all the dependencies that their software depends on, put those on the computer too, 
And then to give it to the world, they actually have to plug it into the internet. And then they're done. They've succeeded. But production is hard. And like all hard things, you generally only notice at night when you're fast asleep. And now your app is just, just the world loves it. And the server goes down. And thankfully, you set up your alerts. And so you wake up, and your hair is on fire. And so you grab a couple of computers. And then you remember, oh, crap, I have to do the duct tape thing. And so you start duct taping frantically, hoping, hoping that maybe if you just connected to the internet fast enough, put out the fire, it'll be good. And you go back to sleep. Maybe you sleep in that day because it's been long, and you've missed the news that happens that morning that heart bleeds occurred, and now all of your servers are impacted, and you wake up and, oh, God. <laughs> Instead of focusing on the software that you love, your heart broken. So a lot of organizations solve this, right, by having this new role, the operator. And the operator is responsible for the machines. They love their machines, and so they take care of them. But what this does, right, is it creates a new problem. It creates a people problem. Now there's this people barrier between the software and the machines. And now people are angry, and you're both sad and angry. So that's no good. So instead of living in this world, you end up living in this world. Heartbreaking. You want to share your software with the world, and it's hard. Combine these two, and you have high cost of change and high cost of distribution. And so instead of living in this world of rapid iteration, you live in this world of painfully slow iteration, where the risk is all of a sudden really high. It's hard to course correct. And the odds of you delivering something of low value go up. <sighs> that sucks. Because building software should not be like building bridges. We know that. So here's where Pivotal comes in with our mission to transform how the world builds software. What we want to do is provide technologies and practices that transform the bridge building culture into this agile software building culture. So let's look at this monolith problem. What do we do there? Well, we have Spring and the vast Spring ecosystem. That means you don't have to worry about inventing tires. And the whole thing is just beautifully consistent. And so you have a nice, consistent programming model that cleans the mess up. But the best part is, with Spring Boot and Spring Cloud, powered by Netflix OSS, you can take that monolith and break it up into microservices. And the developers rejoice because now they can have what they want. They can be small teams of developers working on independent code bases separated by nice and clean interfaces. This brings efficiency back. So you don't have to live in this world. You can live in this world. But what about distribution? Have we taken a difficult problem and now made it even harder? That would not be good. And here's where Cloud Foundry comes in. So Pivotal Cloud Foundry is a platform intended to solve this problem. And Pivotal Cloud Foundry makes a promise. It makes a promise to the developer. It says to the developer, trust me with your code. Take your code. I'll find the dependencies for you. I'll package it up in what we call a droplet and run it in a container for you. And I'll route it to the internet. You don't have to think about it. We'll take care of it. And when it's popular and maybe starting to give in to the pressure, don't worry about it. Leave the fire hydrant at home. No need to fret. Simple command will scale you right up, and you'll be back in business. And when there's a security vulnerability that impacts the operating system, don't worry about it. Pivotal commits to shipping a fix, and with a simple downtimeless rolling deploy, you're back in business. Developer doesn't have to do anything. So they don't have to choose between the software they love and fighting fires. It's all about what they love. And we make a similar promise. Sorry. Uh, we, have a, we, have a, we have a little haiku that captures this, this sentiment. Um, what we promise the developer is that they can say this. Here is my source code. Run it on the cloud for me. I do not care how. Now we make a, a similar promise to the operator. It goes something like this. Here are my servers. Go make them a Cloud Foundry. I, I don't care how. And what Cloud Foundry allows us to do is to get rid of this barrier and live in a world where the developer can just bring their code, makes the developer happy, makes the operator happy. And so we go from this to this. And that's the power of Spring and Cloud Foundry combined. 
But there's more. Um, sorry, this gives you rapid iteration, but there's more. Pivotal is more than the sum of Cloud Foundry and Spring. Um, to explain this, I want to zoom in on this little picture. I want to talk about uh, this thing that we call the circle of code. Um, you see, all code begins with an idea. When you take that idea and you, you form a plan, and you go from that plan, you write some code, you run that code through your integration pipelines, and then you deploy it to the machine, and then you gather feedback. And based on that feedback, you come up with new ideas. We talked about Spring being the best way to write that code. We talked about Cloud Foundry being the best platform to run that code. Pivotal also has Tracker, the best tool to plan for that code. We have Concourse, which we're going to be releasing as part of Cloud Foundry. Powerful, powerful CI build system. And we have PCF metrics and our big data suite for analyzing your application once it's up and running. We have all of these things, and we're working to bring them closer together because we know that our customers win when they can go around the circle very efficiently. But this isn't just a technology problem. It's also a culture problem. How do you actually build an organization that's geared towards going around this as quickly as possible? And for that, Pivotal has its consulting program, Pivotal Labs, where we're teaching a development process that enables rapid iteration. There's a lot that I can say about labs, but I want to talk about a few. Uh, um, I could talk about pair programming. I could talk about test-driven development. I could talk about small, balanced teams. I don't have time to talk about all those things, so I'm going to focus on pair programming. So pair programming is kind of crazy if you've not experienced it. It's literally one machine with two developers working on that same machine, constantly communicating and collaborating as they co-develop software. This is very different from what you see in most places, a cubicle farm with individuals working on their machines solo. Now, when you're working solo, it's much easier to be distracted. When you're pairing, it's kind of awkward to be on your phone. It's a lot less distraction. This makes for productive developers. We tend to think that happy developers are productive developers, but as Rob May, our CEO, likes to remind me all the time, it's actually the reverse. Productive developers are happy developers, and with pairing, we allow people to be productive. Now, there's more, right? There's, there's serious organizational risks when you have individuals going off and writing all the code, right? We, I, I call this cowboys, right? They're like, I'm awesome. I got this. I'm going to kill this. It's going to be great. Don't worry about it. I got it. So all the other developers kind of going, oh, what, are you, what are you doing? And invariably, this person leaves, <laughs> and this person's left holding the bag. And that's actually very dangerous. And it brings a halt to rapid iteration because no one knows that code. No one can change it. With pair programming, we have constant collaboration. And then there's miscommunication, right? When you're not talking, well, you know, you piss each other off, and now you're at each other, and the whole office is just fighting. <laughs> With pair programming, we have constant communication. People are always at least trying to be on the same page. And when you're on your own, you get stuck, and sometimes not even Google can help. With pairing, you have a friend who can help get you unstuck. These are just some aspects of pair programming that make it a catalyst for going around that circle incredibly efficiently. And that's Pivotal Labs. It takes rapid iteration and turns it into something that looks more like this, continuous iteration. And so you go from this picture, which was already pretty good, to something that looks like this, constantly, continuously del delivering value, very little risk, constant feedback, and you're always shipping. And that's the power of Pivotal Cloud Foundry, Spring, and Pivotal Labs. It's how we're transforming how the world builds software. And we love it. All right, thanks, y'all.